Hello, folks out there in television land. I'm so happy you're here in Jerusalem, in the hills of near Jerusalem, Beitar, Yair Davidi city. In the hills and the mountains, the air is salul kayayin v'reyachoranim, full of the smell of blossoming flowers and clear like wine. So <clears throat> I had some word humor that I wanted to share because we, we play with words. You know, if um, if Freud had gone into a, the dress business, he would have had the Freudian slip. So venison for dinner again? Oh dear. How does Moses, Moses uh, make tea? He brews it. England has no kidney bank, but it does have a liver pool. I tried to catch some fog, but I missed. They told me I had type A blood, but it was a type O. I changed my pods, my iPods name to Titanic. It's sinking now. Jokes about German sausage are the worst as in W-R-S-T. I know a guy who's addicted to brake fluid, but he says he can stop any time. I stayed up all night to see wh where the sun went, and then it dawned on me. This girl said she recognized me from a vegetarian club, but I never met her before. H-E-R-B-I-B-O-R, -B -B right? When chemists die, they bury them, B-A-R-I-U-M. I'm reading a book about anti-gravity. I just can't put it down. I did a theatrical performance about puns. It was a play on words. Why were there Indians, why were the Indians here in America first? They had reservations. Did you hear about the cross-eyed teacher who lost her job because she couldn't control her pupils. When you get a bladder infection, you're in, you're in trouble. Broken pencils are pointless. What do you call a dinosaur with an extensive vocabulary? A theosis. I dropped off, I dropped out of a communist class because of lousy marks. I got a job at a bakery because I needed dough. Veloco what a ripple. Don't worry about old age. It doesn't last. As you well know, we, we um, think things are funny. My dear beloved friends in South Africa, some of them say we're not supposed to joke around because people will think we're not taking the serious topic seriously, but that's not our tradition. We think there's a huge amount of humor in the Bible, a huge amount of humor in you know, explanations of the Bible, and laughter, when it's controlled and not out of bounds, makes people happier, and it connects people and connects people to the one trying to teach them. It's the connector. So guess what? I'm on my favorite topic, our Judah and our beloved tribes. And I said before, the most sensational news event of the year, yet hidden, completely hidden in plain sight for most people, right? You guys know that. You know that's what we think. And it's our hope with all these efforts, with uh, what everyone's doing on social media, what they're doing, what Yair is doing. Um, it's our hope to assist in providing better understanding of this amazing event that's taking place and the information provided in these speeches and these writings and these YouTubes, etc., will help move us towards the ultimate redemption and reconciliation and establishment of the United Kingdom of Israel. Let's make Israel great again. And the Oral Torah adds substantially, substantial, whatever said in the Oral Torah is substantial. It comes out of the written Torah. It comes right out of it. 
but you got to study it on very deep structure levels to catch that. If the oral Torah provides substantial and comprehensive testimony to this topic and the reality of the lost ten tribes and their eventual re-identification reconciliation with Judah is an all-embracing prophetic promise of redemption. And, something I mentioned before, the author and Orthodox Jewish commentator, Yair Davidi, has written numerous books on the topic of the Lost Ten Tribes, given numerous uh, presentations on this high technology things we have in front of us, these cameras and everything. I'm still sending uh, carrier pigeons. I call cars horseless carriages, you know. But yeah, here, he's right up there. On the state of the arts, getting messages out. He uses evidence from the Oral Torah quite frequently to prove the whereabouts of Ten Israel today and throughout history. And with regards to the tribes of Israel, there are many, 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 many deep insights into God's written Torah that we only get when we look at it through the lenses of its companion, the Oral Torah. Just one example, I may have sh shared this example with you before, that gematria, it's not, it's not mysticism, that he, God, you know, God, God, the creator of heavens and earth, he, he gave us Hebrew that has a pictorial dimension, the letters have a, a picturesque dimension, and they have a numerological, it, they have a numbers, it's, a, it's not you're putting a number system on them, they came, each letter is a number, so it's really amazing, amazing, amazing. You take a, a line from the Torah and it equals a certain amount. And you find another line on the other side of the Torah that has the same numerical value. And these two verses complement each other. It's amazing. And remember, you know how in math we have arithmetic, reading and writing, and arithmetic taught to the tune of a hickory stick. So we have arithmetic, you have algebra, geometry, trigonometry, calculus, statistics, log algorithms. So same thing in, in our numerical analysis of the Torah. There are many different ways to do it. So I'm doing a simple way, you know, because cause it's good. From, for example, um, new paths of understanding can be explored in additional light to be revealed from the Holy Torah. It's a method that it's ancient. It comes with the Torah. When we got the Torah, the letters had numerical value. And I'd like to take an example of one of those things um, that have to do with the tribes. Remember the biblical figure of Joseph, the righteous Joseph? Yeah, yeah, he was righteous. He stood above all the bad stuff in Egypt and didn't get involved in it. So he represents the ten tribes as do the biblical references, Ephraim and Manasseh. So we compute the numerical value of the Hebrew letters contained in the phrase, a fruitful son of Joseph, Genesis 49. We arrive at a total of 732. The Balaturim, for example, one of the great Jewish commentators, amazing guy, genius, cool, cool dude, really cared about everybody, points out that this is also the numerical value of Ephraim and Nasha. That Jacob said that Ephraim and Manasseh shall be like Ruvain and Shimon, remember? And, and that's 731. And that works out perfectly with Gematria being one off for many acceptable historic Jewish reasons, biblical reasons, which I think is very complicated to get into. So you see that Ephraim and Asha has a numerical value of Reuben and Shimon. Very interesting. And, and Jacob said that they're going to be like Reuben and Shimon. So this works out perfectly. This is only one minor example of the application of gematria to expand wider 
and never-ending number of hidden biblical gems, nug gold nuggets. All of this is part of the oral explanations passed on from generation to generation. So you all know as this is a current developing phenomena of people coming back to their tribal identity. Um, our, our lost tribes that some of them didn't, most of them passed right through eventually, but some of them stayed in Germany of all places as a group that's highly identified with Ephraim and struggling to come back to the Hebrew roots. And they're suffering great um, uh, anti-Semitism, people treating them like Jews and they hate Jews and they're being treated unfairly in all kinds of things. I hear the howling of the wolf on the new moon out there in Germany calling up to Hashem. And they're getting in trouble because they're looking into our Hebrew Bible. It's amazing. Absolutely amazing what's going on. So that's the breaking news concerning Israel. The big deal is the returnees from the lost Hebrew tribes have over the decades are coming home as regular folk who can enter the palace of Torah comprehension. And yes, we Jews have thus benefit from this quoting Song of Songs, well of living waters. These returnees have revealed to us beautiful fragrant, fragrant orchards in droves for some time already while well, we've been blissfully unaware of any of this happening right in front of our face. And it's all happening in a very modest way, as I pointed out before, quietly. Well, we're not giving ourselves an evil eye, but we, we need to realize it's happening. And soon we, we hope that we'll have that, that verse coming alive to us, Ephraim shall know not envy Judah, and Judah shall not vex Ephraim. Not vex. Not, I didn't say vex. I said vex. Shouldn't vex Ephraim. More and more groups at great personal sacrifice for this howling wolf in Germany under the new moon, calling out to the new moon that it's being sanctified. They're sanctifying God's name and the unity of God, and they're experiencing ravenous cruel, vicious anti-Semitism. Amazing. Because you believe in one God for the nations that don't, that makes you Jewish enough for them. Notwithstanding difficult uh, visa restrictions to come to our country, and they, the tribes are managing to grow and to contribute to the general welfare of Judah and the land. If given half a chance, the far majority of them would be willing to place themselves on the front lines in defense of their brothers of Judah and Israel. Now, many, many, many Jews, Jewish people, have assimilated, and who have they assimilated into? Are Ephraim. And when they come back, their return with Israel's, lost Israel's return, is what, what's what the end of days are all about. What can I tell you? It's happening. Um, there's something i got to get off my, my chest that I wanted to share with you guys. Torah Siva Lano Moshe Marashaki Elas Yaakov. You know what that means, right? Torah, 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 Siva Lano Moshe Marashaki Elas Yaakov Marashaki Elas Yaakov. Deuteronomy 33. The Torah, which was commanded to Moses, is a heritage to the congregation of Jacob. There's no gaps, there's no breaks. We're the congregation of Jacob, and we've kept on trucking, and we never have given up on it, even though we had a lot of friction internally and out externally. So one of the things that makes Judah afraid of Ephraim is it looks chaotic. Ephraim looks like it was, there's like zillions of different positions, and they're very, you know, from well, Christianity, coming out of Christianity, you know, people, things are very black and white. Timothy, right? 
gnashing of teeth and fire and brimstone. So Jews, by our nature uh, of being in sync with God's words, God's words are eternal and they're infinite. And so when we can see it from different angles, we see different beauty like this of a huge diamond. And you see it's shining in different ways. We're used to saying, Elu ve'elu divrei lakim chayim. These and these are the living words of God. But a lot of Ephraimites are very dogmatic, which they picked up from, out, from their wanderings. So the problem with that, if it's not a dogmaticism that's connected to the code of Jewish law, so it'll be chaotic if they come here. It'll be a, a nuts, and that scares Jews. So Ephraim's got to remember that there is a, a organization of God's word. It's there's a mechanism, divine mandate, Genesis 49. Judah is the lawgiver, right? We have some amazing revelations all the time it's coming out to us from from our, when we delve into the Hebrew body with our traditional um, historic biblical mindset. We are called the Machalkeik, the lawgiver. And may the contents of our speeches and our talks and our writings assist in bringing some agreement and unity by demonstrating the divine appointment of Judah as the lawgiver of God, or law interpreter, and divinely mandated authority. Now, a Christian's world has studied much, but not enough of the original religious Hebrew heart and mindset of these very Jewish messianic writings. In addition, they have neglected the 24 books of the Tanakh and separated it from it's an original environment of harmony between oral and written Torah. And the Torah, which Moses was commanded, is a heritage for the congregation of Jacob. We have direct, we, we know all the heads, we know all the big guys, and their holy women, their holy wives, that from the time of Sinai until today, we know who did this passing on of that tradition. And we live it. And these people who lived thousands of years ago are like our brothers and sisters and our great teachers, and we stand on their shoulders. There's a dynamic relationship to us and all of the light, the torchbearers that went through history. Um, let me think of something. Uh, you know, I mentioned before that the Hebrew alphabet, like ancient Egyptian and Chinese, is also pictorial. And the holy letters have a graphic dimension. This is in addition to the sounds, vowels, and consonants. The sounds and pictures described by our holy letters go together like a love. Love and marriage, horse and carriage, you can't have one without the other. So the very pictorial representation of a biblical word, for example, guard, G-U-A-R-D, you know, shomer, is a picture of a simple handmade corral or fence, a field fence made of interconnecting branches of sticks of thorns and thistles. So our, our Torah leadership are comparable to shepherds who need to fence in their beloved sheep, as it says in Song of Songs, from fear in the dangerous night. So thus, the very concrete physical black ink of of the shape of the letters cries out for leadership to protect and tangentially guard the Torah. That's not adding, that's just protecting. No rabbi ever calls a protective measure a Torah law. They are merely placing a hedge of roses, roses around to protect and guard the Torah laws from the being carelessly trampled upon. Thus, it is a biblical directive to erect fences around the law. So many, many examples of that, which we won't go into this moment. The Torah commands us in no uncertain terms to take whatever protective measures which those in authority deem necessary. The fence made by the shepherd for his herd is man-made for a specific purpose, utilizing the shepherd's intelligence, creativity, and wisdom. Now we can see, touch, feel, and hear the deep biblical basis 
for the following Mishnah. Moses received the Torah from Sinai and transmitted it to Joshua, Joshua to the elders, the elders to the prophets, and, and what, what, guys, you, you know, the prophets transmitted it to the men of the great assembly. The original had 80 prophets within the, the sages, and they, the men of the great assembly, said three things. Be deliberate in judgment, fair, honest, careful, careful and trust, and just. Develop many disciples to an independent level and make a fence for the Torah. You may make a safer Torah. Why do we put a fence on the Torah so we have a safer Torah? Enact provisions and cautionary rules to safeguard against transgression. So we have a divine appointment of Judah as a ruling authority throughout. And you have a question in Torah, you know who you can ask? Yair Davidi. He's a great scholar and he also has great research abilities. So you have a question? It's not up to you to try to figure it out. You can study it. Trying to study it out is a mitzvah. You're getting divine merit for that. But the ultimate decision, what it is or isn't, you got to consult with Judah, the lawgiver, right? The scepter shall not part from Judah, nor the Lord give her from between the Lord, from the between his feet until Shiloh comes, and until him shall the obedience of the peoples, the nations be. You see, one Chronicles, chapter five, verse two, for Judah prevailed over his brothers, and of him came the chief rulers. So the Hebrew word scepter here is shevet. Shevet means tribe or rod. In modern Hebrew, it mainly means tribe. In the Tanakh, it is used 143 times to denote a tribe, a division of a nation. It is the preferred term used for the 12 tribes of Israel in Genesis 49 and Exodus 28, 21. Shevet is also used to denote rod. As a rod, the word Shevet is used to denote a symbol of authority in the hands of a ruler. As such, it is translated scepter in Genesis 49 and in Amos 1, the prophet Amos, who gave uh, correction to the 12 tribes, verse 5 and 8. And it is used as an instrument of warfare by Messiah at the establishment of the kingdom. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor, right? And uh, etc., etc. You guys know that stuff by heart, right? You guys know everything by heart. Just got to know it a little bit in Hebrew by heart. We can all easily accept that God is our judge and lawgiver, for God is our judge. God is our Lord giver. God is our king. He will save us, Isaiah 32, 22. And other religions like Christianity and Islam, they agree with Isaiah. There is only one Lord giver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But you who are to judge your neighbor, anyone who speaks against his brother or, or or judges him, speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you are not keeping it, but sitting in judgment. So even opposers of God's law would not think to deny, of denying that God is a lawgiver. As uh, you can quote passages in the NT and in the Quran, which would uh, show what I'm talking about. They would, they would, however, take exception to the following scriptural statement and undoubtedly find or create reasons for arguing it away. The onus is on you as the individual reader to consider this scripture I just mentioned and decide how you would attempt to interpret and accept it. The following biblical text uses the exact same Hebrew words, mechol cake, when referring to Judah as the lawgiver. In Psalm 67, God states, Judah is my lawgiver. Mechokek, in Psalms 108, God repeats that Judah is my Mechokek, lawgiver. The word Mechokek appears only six times in the Bible, in the Tanakh. Once it refers directly to God himself, as quoted above in Isaiah 32. Twice in Psalm 60 and the Psalms 108, quoted above, I just mentioned them to you, which refers clearly to Judah, the Jews, as Judah is my lawgiver. And some English translations render it my scepter. Of the three remaining incidents, twice it is a vague reference, and the final incident is an equally bold declaration regarding Judah as the primary uh, activist here. 
you know, we have a we have a, a verse that says, um, Chokli Yisrael, Mishpat Lil Ke Yaakov, right? That what we'll experience as a statue is a judgment for the God of Israel. That we, on the blessing of the first, on the new moon, we declare that he gave us the power and the system to declare the, the new moon within the system, the biblical mandate system, which we keep to this very second day. And we can't pe keep it perfectly because we don't have a temple. And we couldn't keep it perfectly because Gentiles would, and Jew-hating Jews would try to sabotage it. But there's a system, a complicated biblical system, a mandated biblical mandate, Deuteronomy 17, etc., 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 etc. It's a puzzle one. That that mandates this. So when when is the new moon? Who, when's that going to be? Who's going to create that? We create that. God made it so that we create it. You know, like a bride and groom, the bride tells the groom when, when she's ready for him to come in. So when it comes to the Sabbath, it happens every seven days. But when it comes to the new moon, the holidays, it's like a bride and groom. It's like a honeymoon, not like a, a husband and wife. The husband and wife uh, is more like the Sabbath. It's always there. But the holidays are like fresh celebra celebrations. Okay, so we declare the moon. So when we make it a chok for us, a statue, God considers a judgment for him. He, wait, let, he waits to hear what we're saying. So people have twisted this terribly. The, the, the astronomy doesn't declare the new moon. Uh, uh, we're not, we don't declare a new moon based on this uh, telescope in Australia. We declare the moon the way God told us to, and then he accepts that as a judgment for himself. We, ex we make the statue, now is the new moon, and God accepts it. And that's what the verse says. Chokli Yisrael, Mishpat Ke Yaakov. Um, it's important to know. We sing every day. I, I really, Judah doesn't realize how... how Ephraim is so excited about doing mitzvahs and so thrilled with, with keeping the Torah. And they're getting into these different topics like, can you make a uh, slaughter uh, for a sacrifice, for the Passover sacrifice, which doesn't necessarily need a temple to do that. Okay, well, how, when are we going to get back to the, the primary way of doing um, the sanctification of no, But a little renegade, ignorant Jews and wide-eyed ten tribes don't decide for Judah the way God's system has been working for 3,340 years. They have to have a little bit of uh, humility. And also, that's what scares a lot of Jews when these arrogant guys shooting their mouth off ignorantly. It scares, oh my God, this is going to be chaos. We can't deal with this. So a little um, humility goes a long way in making Judah relaxed enough to do what Judah needs to do. We just love you guys. So I have a story for you. First, you know, we sing, So Yisrael kumo b'yezras Yisrael, Ukdei kumecha Yehuda b'Yisrael. We beg God, the rock of Israel, to un the, the God of Judah and Israel to bring us home. Every day we're praying for this. So it's just the th thing with a Jewish person. You just got to say, it's happening now. Because he already knows it will happen. But the, the big deal, the Kiddush, will be to know it's happening now. So once upon a time, the Spanish Inquisition, in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue with the Nina and the Pinta and the Santa Maria. They got off the boat left on the 9th of Av. Columbus was most likely Jewish, halakhically. A hidden Jew, his ship's cap, his ship's mates, the doctors, the translators, most of them were all Jewish, and they were looking. The Don Yitzchak Barbanel was the greatest rabbi at the time. He was a finance minister. We knew that you wouldn't fall off the world. Other people thought you did because our Torah, our oral Torah, already told us that the world moves, it spins, it's like a globe. And there's some power that's holding us all down. When you stand upright with your wife and kids and house and animals on one side, you're doing the same other people standing upright on the other side. We were not afraid of falling off the world, but we also needed a, our excuse is looking for a, a spice route to India, right? But the practice, we needed somewhere to escape to. So, 
um, the Spanish Inquisition outlawed learning Torah. They found, they caught this fellow who was teaching Torah. And they beat him up and they torched him a bit and they brought him out for judgment with chains, arm chains, body chains, leg chains. And they said, listen, Jew, you were part of a Spanish aristocracy. You were a respected citizen. We can return you to your status as part of Spanish aristocracy and a respected citizen, but you have to accept our Jesus. You have to accept our Christianity. And he says, por favor, senor, yo no puedo. I can't. The chains are too tight. So they immediately removed his body chains. They dropped into the dust, bloody. And he said, okay, so again, we're going to tell you, you broke the law, you're a Murano, but you can repent and you can accept the church and you'll be restored to your former position of wealth and honor. He said, por favor, amigo mío, no, yo no puedo, I'm not able to, because the chains are too tight. They removed his leg chains, threw him into the dust, likewise bloody. Okay, that's it. Now, accept a baptism immediately. He said, what do you want from me? That's impossible. The chains are too tight. So he removed his handcuffs, the equivalent in those days. And they said, Apuritre, ya casa empieza. Andale, arriba, akshav, ahora. Now accept our Messiah, Son of God. He said, I can't, the chains are too tight. So the officiating captain smacked him, kicked him, threw him to the ground. What are you, in making fun of us? What are you, insulting us? You have no chains on you. He says, I can't because the chains are too tight. The chains going from Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Sarah, Rebecca, Leah, Rachel. The chains going to Moses, Aaron, the Levites, the elders. The chains going to David, Solomon, to our great rabbis, our great rebbitsons. Those chains are too tight and those chains you will never break. Well, Judah has to know that when Ephraim gets a little education, when they delve into the Hebrew roots of what they're believing in, and it carries them out like on wings of an angel, it carries them away from mistakes, errors, lies, brainwashing, and carries them up when they tell, connect their Hebrew roots. They're the Hebrew nation too. They're not less than... Hebrew nation and we the Jewish people except their identity is in a state of nistar, of hiddenness. Our identity is nigla, revealed. So as soon as our Ephraimites, as soon as Joseph and Manasseh, as soon as Ephraim get connected back to the Hebrew roots, get connected back to Torah, they feel the golden chain that links all generation. Why do we think it's golden? Because we had to give up trillions of dollars of wealth to be part of the Hebrew nation in the secular, assimilated, acculturated pagan world. Okay? So you got to appreciate this story is also, as you can tell about the same story about our, our returning Hebrews. They have, they're filling the chains that connect them and tie them back to the creator of the world and his Torah and his people. And those chains are too tight. And they're never going to be able to be broken once they're aware of who they are. And it's Oleno. It's our responsibility to hug and kiss them, to pray for them and help them and use our talent and creativity and humorous ways to bring them home. Thank you for your time. And don't give up. Don't despair. The salvations of our Shema are blinking of the eye.